Браво. Buonasera a tutti, chiedo scusa per questo piccolo ritardo nell'inizio nell della conferenza. Eh, questa sera abbiamo l'onore di avere come ospite il professor Miroslav Barta dell'Università di Praga, direttore del Czech Institute of Egyptology e, ed è un grande onore averlo con noi nell'ambito del ciclo delle conferenze ACME che come sapete ha come scopo quello di divulgare ma soprattutto di raccogliere eh, studiosi anche proprio da tutto il mondo per porre in contatto il grande pubblico, gli studenti e anche i colleghi in realtà a contatto con le innovazioni e soprattutto sui grandi progressi che la ricerca egittologica sta compiendo ed è anche proprio per questo che eh, non poteva mancare il nome del professor Barta in questa circostanza visti gli enormi e incredibili risultati che le missioni archeologiche cieca che, sta, che lui dirige eh, ha compiuto proprio negli ultimi 3-4 anni per cui è veramente un grande piacere questa sera poterlo ospitare peraltro per chi non lo conoscesse più da vicino o comunque non conoscesse il suo lavoro eh, il professor Barta è uno dei massimi esperti per quanto concerne possiamo dire veramente l'archeologia e la storia dell'antico regno in realtà poi il suo campo di interessi spazia a esplorare anche dinamiche politiche e sociali sempre legate all'antico regno ma in realtà poi eh, è proprio, sono gli scavi compiuti nella necropoli di Abusir ad aver coinvolto, ad aver eh, possiamo dire focalizzato la sua attenzione e proprio per, questo, per questa ragione eh, è una delle figure sicuramente di riferimento e non poteva mancare nel calendario dunque delle nostre conferenze. Peraltro eh, segnalo anche eh, l'uscita a breve, eh, è, è già pubblicato, ah, chiedo scusa, è già, è già nel nostro bookshop, ecco non lo sapevo, la pubblicazione, la traduzione peraltro proprio di un libro che lui ha scritto nel 2011, eh, Viaggio verso Occidente, la tomba egizia nell'antico regno, è un volume che tratta dell'evoluzione, eh, ha un taglio ovviamente molto archeologico vista la Uh, la, um, il taglio specifico appunto del, del, degli studi di Barta ma uh, affronta non soltanto in termini archeologici l'evoluzione architettonica funeraria del, uh, delle tombe nell'antico regno ma soprattutto quelle che sono poi le implicazioni politiche, storiche e sociali che uh, tale evoluzione e questi, soprattutto questi documenti uh, rappresentano per cui uh, è con grande piacere che vi uh, presento il nostro ospite uh, questa sera Uh, questa, tra l'altro mi vorrei soltanto aggiungere che mh, queste conferenze sono realizzate grazie al supporto uh, dell'Associazione degli Scarabei che ci sostiene, sostiene appunto i nostri sforzi per adempiere i nostri scopi uh, statutari e uh, questa sera in particolar modo abbiamo anche un ulteriore supporto nella uh, società Lenter Studio che si sta occupando di trasmettere questo per la prima volta una conferenza ACME eh, in streaming per cui in questo momento la conferenza viene trasmessa anche sul canale YouTube del museo e proprio anche in risposta a una grande richiesta che ci è stata fatta dagli utenti, dagli internauti eh, di poter assistere alla conferenza anche se non sono a Torino e molte di queste richieste venivano appunto da eh, diversi paesi anche eh, nel mondo per cui è con grande piacere che questa sera inauguriamo anche questo tipo di eh, approccio alla diffusione, alla divulgazione che fa parte in fondo del DNA del museo eh, chiedo scusa, del museo ma è anche proprio dell'ACME Bene, um, I switch in English for the English speaker. Um, I, I want to introduce, it's, uh, so uh, uh, this evening uh, I, it's my pleasure to welcome you uh, to the Museo Egizio uh, to, um, in a, another event of the ACME Lectures series. Um, as you know, uh, since uh, 1974, The ACME Lecture Series is driving uh, outstanding scholars um, to update uh, students, the general public and also colleagues um, in what's happening in uh, Egyptological research. Um, for this reason, it's um, a pleasure, it's my privilege to introduce you um, Dr. Miroslav Barta, Professor of Egyptian Archaeology at the University of Prague 
uh, director of the Czech Institute of Egyptology. Uh, and uh, so beside the prizes, he was awarded for his uh, scientific activity. Uh, his work is especially renowned for the archaeological investigation he is leading in the Abuzir necropolis, uh, the necropolis of Old Kingdom. And uh, <clears throat> pleasure to have uh, Professor Barta here. So welcome in Turin. Uh, thank you for, be, for being here. And um, thank you for your contribution to the ACME Lectures series. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, it's really my pleasure to be back in Turin after maybe 15 years. So I was here last time as a student in the 90s, and I toured the North Italian museums, and I remember still the old appearance of the museum and I have to say that um, what uh, Italian Egyptologists in this museum achieved within a year is just fascinating. Fascinating and you have to be proud. And first of all of the collection which is it's, it's really hard to say how to qualify it but it's one of the best collections in Europe for sure. Um, here um, because in a, some way we all we all Czechs follow uh, in the footsteps of Czerny when coming to Turin and because you may uh, know that Czerny when he was young working still in a bank he always took a night train on Friday to Turin worked here over the weekend and on Monday morning he was arriving back to Prague and this is how the story of Prague and Turin connection started um, and last but not least, I would like to uh, thank for the kind invitation of ACME, um, Senora Facchetti, who took uh, uh, care of all the preparations, and Dr. Ferraris, who, um, who was quite patient with me today uh, when I was staying in the museum. By the way, I can recommend it to everyone to come here on Monday afternoon, because it's, it's splendid. It's splendid. Um, so tonight I will talk about Abu Sir, which is uh, known or even famous for several historical periods for many individual monuments dating to the third, now already to the second, because we discovered a new kingdom temple only recently, and late period, or the first, so to say first millennium uh, BC. These are traditional views of the pyramid site, that is dating to the 5th dynasty, so to say, when the kings of Giza vanished. So Uzerkaf started new dynasty, um, and Sahura was the first king who built, or who started the pyramid necropolis in Abu Sir. So here you have pyramid complex of Sahura, then um, Neferikara, Raneferev, which is not visible at the moment, and um, New Sarah, these four outstanding kings of the 5th dynasty decided to build their um, burial complexes um, in Abu Sir. And this view is quite exceptional because it was taken from the top of the pyramid of Djoser, Necherihe Djoser, whose famous reliefs from Heliopolis you also treasure in your museum. And when people ask me where is the beginning and the end of the concession, I say, the concession starts roughly here and finishes with the last pyramid in Abu Sir, so to say the pyramid complex of Sahura. Um, with regards of the dates, because we have to orientate ourselves, um, we are roughly in the second half of the 25th and in the 23rd um, millennium uh, century BC as you can see here this is the time range for the fifth dynasty based on the latest publications and see 14 dates um, roughly 2460 to 2320 um, um, which is also this year marks the the beginning of the end of the old of the old kingdom um, let me show you first 
before we get to new SERA and the latest excavation results to some um, simple facts that may help us uh, to understand better the topography. And as you all know, the topography was very important in the mind of the ancient Egyptians. It had huge religious implications, it had huge practical implications. The Egyptians were always trying to find um, inner links between location of um, individual pyramid complexes, major temples such as Heliopolis or ancient Iunu, the pyramid complexes of Snofruinda, Ashur, etc., etc. Um, so the first two top pictures show you the modern entrance to Saqqara, through where you can also get to Abu Sir, but this entrance was built only in the mid of the 19th century, as we suppose, because Mariad had to get uh, all the finds from Serapium and from the tombs to Bedrashen and to load it on the train and then on the ship. So he built this, this entrance. In, uh, in the third millennium BC, you, you wouldn't be able to take this pass up the hill. Um, you have to realize that um, Memphis was located during the third millennium down to the late fifth dynasty over here. What we have here is the North Saqqara Plateau with the tombs of the first and second dynasties. Here is Djoser and this is Abu Sir here. Um, this green patch of land is the f is indication of the former lake of Abu Sir. And that was actually during the third millennium the major entrance both to Abu Sir and to Saqqara. Um, this lake was seasonal and it is not by chance that um, all but one perhaps priest of the frog goddess Hecat are buried on the shores of the lake. Do you have any explanation for this? It's such a strange title, priest of Hecat, priest of the frog goddess. And we know that Hecat was venerated uh, for her ability to rejuvenate, for rebirth. Um, when you take into consideration that the lake was seasonal. The frogs that were living in the lake always had to start to hibernate when the waters receded. And when the waters during the Nile flood um, fled in again, the frogs were as if rejuvenated out of nothing. So for the ancient Egyptians, it was the most important signal to consider the lake to be connected to be connected with uh, the goddess of rejuvenation. So basically cutting or traveling across the lake enabled the ancient Egyptians to be rejuvenated. That's why we also have this lake as one of the three lakes in the Abydos ritual, the lake of the goddess Hecat. Because in Abydos, the local uh, uh, influential family imitated the real topography of Abu Sir and Saqqara. And in Abu Sin Sakar, there existed three lakes. In fact, in a Bidos ritual, they were only on a mythological level. So coming to Abu Sir or to Sakara, you had to cross the lake of Abu Sir. In the skiff like this, um, this is one of the satellite pictures we did in 2002-2003 um, that provide um, amazing resolution. Uh, which equals to about uh, 60 centimeters per pixel. So in fact, in the, in the desert you can see uh, running puppies. Uh, we are not all sinologists, but uh, still, this is the smallest thing you can discern is a puppy, 60 centimeters. And as you can see with the satellite image, you can easily recognize every single tomb still unexcavated or excavated in the 19th century by Mariette and his predecessors. On the right, you can see just a basic scheme. Old Kingdom capital, north is downwards. 
North Saqqara Archaic Cemetery, Djoser, and the pyramids of Abu Sir, and the major mythological gate to Abu Sir and Saqqara. So even if you wanted to travel to Djoser, you had to go through here. And that's why, as I will show you, the tombs in Abu Sir are so important because they were watching and supervising the processional route leading to North and Central Saqqara. Um, another few basics, the pyramid complexes, quite famous, but I will not dwell on them to tonight for too long. Sahura, the best preserved pyramid complex of the old kingdom with fascinating groups of newly discovered reliefs by Zahi Hawass and Tariq al Awadi. Um, Neferikara, the first place where the so-called Abu Zir papyri were um, discovered in already in the 19th, dynasty, 19th century, excuse me, and they basically brought Borchardt to excavate in Abu Zir because he was desperate to get the remaining portion of the papyri. Um, if he knew that he will discover only the second oldest lot, lot of the papyri, maybe he wouldn't be going because the oldest papyri are where? In Turin, coming from Gebelin. Lucky you. And then Neferikara married Queen Mother Hentkaus, whose complex is here, is Hentkaus too. Don't get uh, misled. And he's got two, um, two kids, uh, Ranefereth, who died very early, so he didn't manage to finish the pyramid, and Nilsera, by far the most important pharaoh of the fifth dynasty. I will tell you later on why. And if you look carefully on this line of three, they are in fact four, the fourth one is here, of Mastaba, still unexcavated when the photograph was taken. So this one is the famous uh, tomb of uh, Queen Mother Hentkaus III. And this spring, if we manage, he will excavate the fourth one. So the whole row will be also excavated. As I indicated already, Abu Sir is a huge necropolis consisting of three major subsides. It's the pyramid field only over here, the shaft tombs of the first millennium of the sixth and fifth centuries BC, uh, featuring the tomb of Eufa, Ujaho Resnet, nowadays kept in the uh, Museo Vaticano. And then the old kingdom, South Abu Sir, with the lake again. And over here is the location of a new kingdom, um, Ramses I, Ramses II uh, temple. So now we can really say that in Abu Sir we have the third, second, and first millennium. Uh, BC very well represented. Everything looks beautiful until you come to Abu Sir, especially to South Abu Sir. You end up in such a situation. Barren desert hillocks. And you have to decide what to do. Because always, always, and it doesn't matter if you have Familia Agnelli at your back or not, it's always limited number of money, time, and people, always. You have to decide, because believe me or not, every hillock is a tomb. To excavate with modern scientific methods of 21st century, such a hillock takes anything between two to three months, and then a couple of years of analysis and publication. So you must be really careful where you start, because once you start, there is no, no return. You have to finish the, the place. Um, that's why it's another stop. Um, it's very, that's what I advise, is to spend a lot of time in the office. First thing you want to do is to analyze old maps, because in many cases, um, and some of you realize it very well. We have famous reliefs, mastaba paintings, wall paintings, statues originating from Abu Sir. 
Saqqara, Thebes, and nobody knows where they come from precisely. Um, one of the clues are old maps. This one is basically one of the oldest maps um, covering the pyramid fields of Dakhshur, as you can see here. Ho Saqqara, I'm, I'm afraid to approach the, uh, the setup here, and Abu Sir over there. And still, what you see here is not a green residue of the lake. It still existed in the time of Lepsius. It was still there. The map is three meters long, and the only way how we could document it in Berlin, in the Academy of Science, um, was to take our uh, photographer and to make individual shots and put them together in a Photoshop and then reproduce them in the satellite atlas of the pyramid fields that we published years ago. And, of course, with the help of this map, the maps by De Morgan and later, um, you can try your chances and re-identify mastabas and places that were excavated more than a century ago and vanished since then. A very nice detail, still with the lake over here. It was quite substantial, even in the 19th century. And as you can see, barren, barren desert, nothing in there. Another thing you want to do is to uh, make a very detailed satellite imaging, which we did almost a decade ago, actually more than a decade ago. I'm getting old, 14 years ago. Uh, and at that time, we had a big problem because not a single satellite was flying over the damaged pyramid fields. So what we had to do was to pay the Quick Bird Company uh, for reprogramming the satellite. So they did it for us. And for this money, we had the right to tell, to refuse as many pictures as we wanted. Because we said we want our pictures between 8.30 and 9 o'clock in the morning to have the shadows. And we said there must not be a cloud cover bigger than 5%. We could afford this. So the result was a satellite image covering as, as the um, map of Lepsius, the pyramid fields of Dashur, Saqqara, Abu Sir, and even Abu Ghraib. That's what makes Massimiliano Nuzzolo very envious. Um, and later on, we basically expanded um, the satellite imagery for all pyramid fields of the Old and Middle Kingdom. Um, we exclude Dar al Medina because we don't consider Dar al Medina to be a pyramid field. <laughs> and uh, when we published this satellite atlas, we just put a very strong cloud cover over here to the west of the pyramids of Snofru. Um, for one simple reason, there is still a very strong military base and we, could, we can see everything but we didn't want to publish it, so we put basically artificial cloud cover on in the southwest, uh, in the southwest corner. The third thing you want to do when you come to a new site, and South Abu Sir is the site that we started to excavate only in 1991, with the famous Mastaba of Kaaper, published in the 60s by Henry George Fisher. Um, is uh, the geophysics. So here on the, on the right, you can see geophysical results combined with satellite image. This tomb belongs to Hetepe from the time of Joser, which is this tomb. So if you, in a GIS, if you put these levels one over another, you can see what is under the surface and what is on the surface. And with this, with the old maps, with hundreds of old books and with some archaeological, historical and Egyptological knowledge, you can decide where you want to invest your money and spend the work of your people. And it's, at the first side, it's very laborious, but at the end you save a lot of time, energy and money. You can see here that many tombs are visible. Basically, every square is a mastaba or a structure 
related to the history, 3,000 years of history of this fascinating site, and here as well. This is, um, this is um, the mastaba of copper over here. This is the complex of the vizier car. Um, to finish this introduction, here you can see um, satellite image, black and white, and 3D image. You can notice that there are principal tombs on the peaks of the, of the hill, hilltops, and to each of one is leading from the lake of Abu Sir an access route. And these are artificial because along them we found residues of chaotic activities. And you can, with mathematical models, you can clearly say which access routes are artificial and which ones are natural. So this is maybe uh, one of the uh, earliest um, or oldest examples of artificial access routes mapped in an ancient Egyptian cemetery. And to make it more fancy, this is the complete three-dimensional, it's not a model actually, it's really reality of the site. And I can't show it here um, because I haven't uploaded the GIS, but basically you can zoom in, you can rotate it, you can really make a theoretical excavation of the site. And of, of, of course you can also control the state of preservation. See it immediately. Um, tonight, uh, this was the introduction. Um, I will try to show you that New Sera is one of a very largely neglected kings of the third millennium. Um, yet, if you look closer at his reign, um, you can recognize and discern easily that he was on the par with Snofru or Khufu or Djoser, and I will try to show you why. Um, one of the things, what is strange on this screen? Do you find something really disturbing here? Well, the time of New Sera, you remember the famous Old Kingdom kings, Menkaura, Khufu, Snofru, Uzerkov. Is one of them portrayed on the knees? One of them? None. None. What happens for the first time in royal iconography here is this. We don't have an earlier attestation. The king gets on his knees. And I will show you the reasons behind this. And of course, the famous Pepe from the 6th dynasty kneeling uh, with the new vessels. But actually, if you go back in the royal iconography, you can figure out that there is no precursor of this iconographic detail prior to New Sera. And New Sera changed everything. Um, it's quite fancy nowadays to talk about climate change. Um, well, what we know is that um, it is precisely during the time of New Sera when we have a new upsurge of new iconographic, iconographic motifs in non royal tombs. Many new scenes. We have market scenes. We have palanquin scenes. We have desert scenes from New Sera onwards, which implies, and we know it from other records as well, that um, from New Sera on, um, the climate was getting drier and drier. The Nile floods were lower and lower. And this is basically the beginning of the end of the Old Kingdom. One of, the, one of several principal factors was a climate change. This wonderful picture comes uh, from Ivan Harper's project. Um, um, you may not recognize the place of origin because it's very high up on the wall, but it's the famous tomb of the two brothers in Saqqara. By the way, the, tomb, the, the two brothers, Nian Khnum and Khnum Hotep, are also attested in some tombs in Abu Sir. Um, Neil Serra um, 
ascended the throne after um, his younger brother who died, passed away prematurely at the age of about 20 years. And Nusera started immediately huge construction projects, including his mortuary complex. He built many new structures also in Giza, as I hear from my colleague Mark Lehner. And Nusera did several new innovations. One of them, okay. well, now it gets more difficult. Um, one of them was this. Is there anyone dealing with Old Kingdom monumental architecture? Not you. <laughs> he, uh, he was basically very lazy. What he did was um, that he incorporated in his pyramid complex the causeway of his father, Neferikara. We know that Neferika had no time to finish his mortuary complex. This goes, this is true also for the causeway. So New Sarah basically took this from his father and make this famous band to link, to join his mortuary complex with the lower portion of the causeway of his father. He also started to build the famous Eckbauten, corner massive structures that resemble the later tradition of the pylons. Here you have the ascent of the causeway. This is a view uh, some, from somewhere here. Um, so this is the causeway of Neusera. Here you can see the pyramid of his um, father. Um, here you have the pylons, the protopylons. This is um, the pyramid temple, the antechamber carré, one of the earliest attested antechamber carrés, which was a kind of a gathering room uh, where, the go where the king was meeting the gods of Upper and Lower Egypt that were depicted in several rows, one after another, above another. And this is one of, a detail of one of these uh, pylons or pro um, egg. Eckbauten. Um, what I have to explain also is a um, quite strange thing. The pyramids are quite small, right? Um, in the fifth dynasty, starting with Uzerkaf and par in particular with Sahura, the kings decided uh, to put more weight not on the pyramids, they refrained from the big pyramids, but on the decoration, on an inner organization inside the temple. For instance, Khufu had very little decoration in his temple as far as we know. And the upsurge, the evolution of rich decoration starts only with Sahura in Abu Sir. Um, there are maybe 500 running meters of decoration attested in his complex in the time of Hufu or Snofru, uh, roughly 60, and still in the time of Uzerkaf, about 120. With the fifth dynasty, what also happens is that uh, with Uzerkaf and Sahura, um, there's a massive influx of non-royal, of officials of non-royal origin into the royal administration, including the uppermost um, layers of administration. The reason was quite simple. The state was getting so complex that they couldn't run it by the family, by the royal family itself. So they let them in. And many things happen. For instance, um, they introduce a title, Kheri Seshta. These are small things in which the principles are encoded. The Kheri Seshta means the one who is over the secret. In the fourth dynasty, the title is almost non-existent. And why? Because everybody who had to shut up was from the family of the king. So they knew it uh, somatically. It's kind of a mafia principle. But if you let in people from outside, from other families, you have to tell them strictly that they have to shut up about things they hear at the court. 
That's why her research done. For instance, and um, there were no banks in the fifth dynasty, but still you had to pay the officials. And many officials from the royal administration also participated actively in the mortuary cult. So how do you pay them? And again, the mortuary architecture is the field, the sphere, which gives you the clues. You know what is this? Storerooms. And with the fifth dynasty, they go up like this. The more storerooms you get, the more payments you have to make. Because they were not like the Phoenicians, they were not burning the offerings on the altars. They were putting them there, and within the framework of the reversion offerings, they were forwarding them to the pockets of individual officials. So in the old kingdom, the built area of the, of the magazines is steeply, is steeply rising. What the fifth dynasty kings did were also the sun temples that started with Uzerkav. The story is long, but if I should give you a succinct extract, I would say that they used the sun temples in order to break the increasing power of the high priest of Iunu from Heliopolis. That's why they decided the sun temples. In fact, if you know Amarna, this is Uh, probably Sahmed got really annoyed with, uh, with Amarna. Um, this is the same principle, and there are text allusions from the time of Akhenaten, Amenhotep IV, that indicate that he purposely followed the example of the fifth dynasty kings. What matters is that for the most time, from Uzerkav down to Jetkara, which is the time span of the sun temples, there is not a single high priest of Iunu attested. So they were completely suppressed. And the king was controlling everything that was going into the sun temples. He even invented a process that was called solarization of the offerings. The principle was as follows. Um, he was sending all the offerings, all the payments to the sun temples. They were put on the altars, this is the sun temple of, um, of Neusera in Abu Ghraib. There were many offering benches also in this courtyard, like in Amarna. The big temple, the small temple, you just put them on the benches. And from there, you send them over to individual mortuary complexes and individual officials and tombs, etc. So it's the upper hand is not the one belonging to the sun priest of Iunu. It's the hand of the king. The king controls everything. So this is the Priyamarna, Priyamarna pattern. And the king as a living pharaoh and as a god. These twin statues also make appearance only in the time of Neusera, not before him. And they are immediately imitated by the non-royal officials. So now maybe understand more the importance. And we are only halfway through. Um, perhaps you recognize this mastaba. It's one of the biggest mastabas of the third millennium BC, built by a non-royal person, famous Ptachshepses in Abu Sir. Um, and surprisingly, um, this Ptachshepses ended up as a vizier but the beginnings of his career were quite biased. He started as a, as a hairdresser at the court, royal hairdresser. So despite not being involved in the executive of the state, he knew in many instances much more than individual ministers, so to say ministers. And when Neusera ascended the throne, he took Ptachshepses with him because he was too well informed. So Ptachshepses is basically the grand, 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 grandfather of all lobbyists. No, I mean it. 
I really mean it. And he started as a vizier. The king wanted to make sure that Tashepses will follow his orders. So if you are a king and you have a very important official in your, in your very close environment, what do you do? It's a, if somebody is from Sicily, you marry him to your daughter. Huh? Because like this, he becomes fully loyal. He is member of the family. He's fully loyal. So this is what happened, this Takshep says. And he's one of the first, actually the second, who did this in the old kingdom. And from now on, all the kings of the remaining old kingdom marry their daughters to high officials just to make sure that they become, they remain loyal. Because from now on, the position of the king started to be eroded more and more. Ptakshep says, for instance, took from the king many former privileges that were exclusive to the king. Boat rooms, magazines, east-west oriented cult chapel, three niches chapel, magazines, um, magazines here and there, monumental porticos, and huge courts. Never before. These are all innovations of Takshepses taken directly from the royal sphere. I mentioned the royal marriages um, to non-royal officials. So maybe you recognize this famous false door from the British Museum belonging to Ptakshepses, who married at the beginning of the fifth dynasty, um, royal daughter of Uzerkav, who was called Hamad. So basically, this Uzerkav, who had really problems with legitimacy on the throne, starts this policy of marrying royal daughters to non-royal um, non officials. By the way, this guy who passed away in the time of Neusera is the first one who um, renders in his Hetep Dinisut formula the name of Osiris. In textbooks, and I will touch the textbook several times during this talk, you read uh, the, the made up stories that, new, uh, that Uz Osiris is connected with Chetkara, etc. The pyramidion with the, with the base here, 
the altar and the big open courtyard for receiving offerings. I mentioned it already. Um, beautifully um, decorated. It's also important to realize that uh, New Sera um, focused on two different uh, spheres of decoration. One of them was referring, that's the slide on the right, nowadays in the Berlin Museum, refer, um, focused on three seasons of the year, on cyclical rejuvenation of the nature and of the sun god Ra under his control, under the control of the king, and on his hepset. Because it was the sun god in cooperation with the king who were controlling the country, not from Heliopolis, but from Abu Sir or Abu Ghurab. So uh, from Neusera Sun Temple, we have also the stations of his Hepset um, feast. And you can see how beautiful these scenes relating to individual seasons of the year um, are. They are really exquisite pieces of art, if there was an art. And um, here is just a quick memo regarding the Amarna age. So now you can really see that Amarna policy of Akhenaten, because I believe that Akhenaten was a very sophisticated politician, was not something invented out of blue, but Akhenaten and his people were quite well informed about the history of the um, old kingdom and they um, used some patterns in order to break the power of the priests, not of Heliopolis in this particular case, but um, of Amun in Thebes. I said already uh, that from the 5th dynasty, there was a, from the beginning of the 5th dynasty, so to say, there was a massive, massive explosion of mandatory expenses. That's something that we know also from modern world. That's why I say that archaeology is very political. And why? There is one simple reason. Archaeology maps both on a micro level as well as a macro level. Individual strategies pursued by individual people or by interest groups or by states. So archaeology gives you very detailed insights into human behavior our advantage, being archaeologists, is that we have the whole process from A to Z. So we don't have to guess. We don't have to guess. We can describe it from the beginning to the end. Um, so, mandatory expenses, starting with Uzerkaf or Sahura, the red bars uh, rep refer to the built area of magazines or storerooms as related to the whole area of the pyramid complexes or pyramid temples. So you can see that from New Sera, they go up, 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 and you're in the time of Pepe II, this is the end of the sixth dynasty. Um, they represent more than a half of the built area. So the expenses were getting bigger and bigger. Beautiful illustration of monu how monumental architecture reflects very dynamic changes in the society are the two-storied two -storied magazines in the temple of Sahura in Abu Sir. So you have to imagine how much was flowing in and out. So the country was basically bleeding for decays by paying unuseful so-called mandatory expenses. And the magazines were built everywhere. This is the complex of Sahura, so magazines are here, magazines are here. And in the time of Pepe, they are not only here, but also along the sides of the Vesekhet court. Uh, that was the second part of the talk, a general economic political background. And now I will show you a couple of um, slides relating to our latest discoveries at Amusir South. And not by chance, they are all related to the time of Neusera. One of the princesses, Princess Sherenepti, by the way, was also daughter of Neusera, married to an unknown guy who was buried in South Sabusir. So it's from the time of Neusera, we have three or four of his daughters married to very high 
potentates of the old kingdom. I will talk about um, um, tomb of the royal physician that was discovered only two years ago, then about AS31, which is an unknown solar mastaba, and I will explain you soon why, and the complex of Sherneptin. The whole, the whole part took us more than 10 years to excavate because if you stand here and you measure down, so the difference is about nine meters, nine meters of archeological and geological deposits. It took us really more than a decade to excavate major part of this complex. This is a kite view. Um, the Mastaba of Shepseska of Anch, quite unique, and the Solar Mastaba are the two oldest or earliest structures in the field excavated here. Then we have rock cut tombs here in the rock with the courtyard of Sherdnepti. And then I will finish with the tomb of Neferinpu, AS 37, which are, so to say, the most important tombs in, the, in this very small um, but very intricate um, cemetery. Shepseskafanch is a typical example of one of those small hillocks. You see nothing on the surface, just a bloody hillock. But when you start to remove it, here was a hillock. You get across more than four meters high architectural remains. Um, of course, the tomb was orientated to the north, to the lake of Abu Sir. On the outer blocks, we came across uh, his beautifully preserved name on graffiti, Shepseskaf Anch, um, corridor chapel leading to a beautifully preserved chapel. As I said, more than four meters tall. A false door in the west wall, as you can see here, the offering niche, and one of our workers giving you an idea how incredibly well preserved is architecture under these hillocks. The false door um, is a real artistic treasure and also a historical treasure due to the titles. Um, first of all, you can notice on the slide on the right that uh, this gentleman decided uh, to pass away without forewarning. That's why they had no time to finish the false door. So nowadays, being an art historian, you can follow step by step the artist took um, in preparation of the false door. First, they um, pre-painted the decoration and the inscriptions. Then came, then came a master craftsman who corrected them in different color. And eventually, um, the artist was started to carve. And here is one of the several places where you can see where he finished the carving and the rest was left still in a, in a paint. So in this way, you, you can beautifully observe um, individual steps in carving of this monumental, of this monumental um, falls door. Uh, what matters are several titles which are quite unique. Uh, he was a chief physician of Upper and Lower Egypt, chief physician of the king. He was also priest in several sun temples. He was um, also a priest of Perza and Per Anch. Per Anch is easy. It's a scriptorium. It's a um, very heavily protected um, complex of buildings that treasured um, major written historical and scientific documents. And we know from the later, late period that in order to enter different parts of this complex, you had to undergo um, rides, um, very difficult rides that are described in some papyri. But Perza is a bigger problem. And um, I think based on later parallels that uh, to be a priest of Perza um, related uh, to a, a physician who was in charge of a um, complex where royal kids were born. This is the context. Again, I can't go into detail. I'm too slow anyway, I'm afraid. 
Um, so this was Shepseska fun. And now we come to the solar mass tabba. Here are some um, earlier photographs that uh, originate from uh, 2003, 2004. You can see how massive was the fill um, between individual structures here. Um, when we were a halfway through, we came across this Roka tombs, Roka tomb, um, which features several uh, particular um, details. One of them you can discern here, that's the entrance that takes shape of a false door. You can see the slab stela quite clearly above the architrave. Architrave, slab stela. And to our surprise, the entrance was not orientated in a direct east-west direction. But about 30 degrees to the southeast. The trick is that um, in this um, latitude, the sun is not rising on the east, but slightly to the southeast. So in order, and this is what we can't explain, why this guy had a permission or took the permission to entertain the idea of the early sunbeams coming inside the chapel touching the standing false door that is destroyed nowadays. It, it vanished in antiquity. But here, precisely here, stood a false door. So it's prior to Abu Simbel, I don't know how it is in, in the New Kingdom in Thebes, but I imagine that um, there is no such an interplay of architecture and um, geography. Um, he is one of the really very few non rural persons that could enjoy the early sun rays of the, of the rising sun inside the chapel, touching directly his false door. And um, another mystery is that this guy had basically the same titles, the foremost of Hnum, um, priest of Per Anch and of Per Za and some others. So we assume that these two guys were very closely related, maybe son, um, the son and the father. Um, and this is just to show you a very nice pearl between our Mastaba. It was very easy to take this one because there were no tourists. But in Abu Simbel, I had to really bribe my friend who is a chief inspector because he was blocking all the people. So if you are Egyptologist, you can really appreciate this picture. It cost me a lot of blood, I have to tell you. <laughs> but you see, there is not a single, not a single person. Not a single person. I'm very proud of this. And uh, remains of his false door. Uh, yes, remains of his false door. And you can see the titles of Perza, foremost of Hnum. Again, to be a priest foremost of Hnum is something really difficult in the third millennium. Um, and now, um, a control question. What is this? What are these two heads? They are ram heads. You can see the ears here. You can even at the back, there are remains of ropes that were fastening the, the horns. So these are small uh, clay made uh, heads of um, Hnum that originate from very close vicinity of this mastaba. And we have to suppose, because there, I have no other explanation, that there was an offering place, a cultic place, maybe a small temple inside the cemetery dedicated to Hnum. Because all these people in South Sabusir, in this particular cemetery, are somehow obsessed with Hnum. And we have these unique, very raw-made clay figurines of Hnum. Um, now we have to move on to the princess, Sharadnepti. As I said, she was one of the daughters of um, Neusera. Um, these are pillars of her um, cult court um, that were discovered by our mission in 2010. 
and we thought February 2011 we will arrive and easily excavate it. And the Arab Spring interfered, so we had to wait. And again, you can see the amazing heights between the top and the lowermost parts of the cemetery. But eventually we managed to excavate the court. By the way, Shepsis Kafanch is here, and this descending passage leads to the solar mastaba. So this is another flight of Old Kingdom steps that gives way to a pillared court associated with the princess. And here we have corridor from which altogether four rock-cut chapels run farther due, uh, further due to the south. Detail of the, of the beautifully preserved pillared um, court in C2 with, with shared Neptune on the right. And details. Um, um, of her name, meaning the heir of, um, of both um, ladies and my colleagues uh, busy uh, copying um, the inscriptions. And this is the corridor I was telling you about. This all together. And now we will dwell on AS60C, which is the mastaba of the princess, and 60D. 60 AD um, building to a certain nefer. The corridor itself is beautifully decorated with altogether five Naoi statues, as you can see here, two of them, um, associated with the princess and some male members uh, from her family. Uh, this is a typical view of one of these two rock-cut tombs or chapels, um, view from the north, west wall, uh, that originally featured individual false doors associated with um, individuals buried in these shafts. Um, unfortunately, in the case of Shertnepti, only very humble remains, fragments from, his, from her false door survived in the fill of the mastabas, in the fill of the shafts. They were completely smashed into pieces. But what we managed to discover was her serdab. At the, next to the entrance into the Rocca Chapel, packed with statues. This is one of the lots. We can see a shared Nepti with her anonymous husband. Up to date, we have no name for this guy. Um, some more statues belonging to her um, husband, shared Nepti with one of her kids and beautifully preserved to a statue that is about this size. And most of them, um, I was lucky because um, when we came across the statues, um, of course we could uh, make sure that they are restored properly, that they are documented properly, but it started to be um, obvious that we need real art historians. And uh, um, thanks to God, one, two of my best uh, friends in Egyptology are Regina Schulz and Gabi Pike. Gabi Pike was, I think, giving a talk here during the fall. So they work on these statues. So we have really, I, in my view at least, best experts on the Old Kingdom, Old Kingdom statues. Um, this is, um, this is um, burial of Asher Nepti's uh, husband uh, in a beautifully carved limestone sarcophagus featuring also some boats and the burial chamber of Sherat Nepti herself. So you can see a striking difference between non-royal husband and royal daughter. Once she got into his family, she lost all the former privileges and at the end ended up in this, I would dare to say, very shabby, very ugly final resting place. No wooden sarcophagus, not talking about a stone one. She was really heavily neglected. And this is the statue I was talking about. Um, if someone here in the room is uh, concerned with art in ancient Egypt, you can recognize immediately that this is a royal workshop. This statue is on the par with the best statues from the fourth dynasty. It's this big, very small. And we know that we have the name. That's the only name, except for Sharon Epti, we have from this uh, chapel, um, E.T., Lord. 
Um, and then it's the next Roca Chapel belonging to a certain Nether, as you can see um, on the false door on the right. Beautifully preserved. Um, I swear that we didn't use any modern paint to improve the quality. It's all genuine. It has survived like this. And it's the only false door sur that survived inside this whole burial compound. So you can see all remaining false door were um, taken away in antiquity. And this is our fancy reconstruction of the original setup of the false door with two tall stands, two offering plates, an altar still in situ, and beautifully um, taken um, details of Nefer himself and uh, his, uh, his spouse, um, Nefer, um, Nefer Hathor. So you can decide if this is not one of the best examples of a fifth dynasty or old kingdom in general um, false doors. And as usual, he was also um, employed in some temples um, of the fifth dynasty kings, as you can see on the titles, both on the left and on the right. And some more exquisite details. And as was the case with Shernepti, also in his Roka tomb, we, we came across a Serdab. These are three statues that were visible uh, shortly after the discovery. This is the first day. Two standing, one seated. Um, and on the second day, um, sunk very deep in the fill, we uh, came across the fourth one, belonging to Nefer and his, uh, and his wife. By the way, um, according to our colleagues, um, uh, Gabe, Pike, and Regina Schulz, this is one of the three best scribal see the statues known from the third millennium. One is in Cairo, another one is in the Louvre, and this is the third one. Um, you can see here, beautifully preserved with a, a papyrus scroll on the lab, uh, writing some offering um, formulas. Uh, we even know this is a new replacement, but it's a correct replacement because we know based on the remains of pieces of wood between his fingers that uh, he was holding a uh, kind of this um, um, scribal artifact implement. Um, we, ha we have the name Nefer. And you can notice um, on this detail that when the restorer was cleaning the statues, he came across these black patches. It's not a dirt, it's not a dust. And um, when we were having a break, I was really tempted to lift um, our tea makers, Galabea. And it took me a couple of minutes to decide if I really want to do it. But since we were since times immemorial on very good terms, I, um, I lifted it and I saw this. So he was running barefoot because it's paint, it's black paint, and the, and the artist was so sophisticated that he, that he didn't miss the opportunity to indicate that he had no sandals. So he painted the same stuff Mbabi had on his feet. He was running barefoot. Just don't tell Mbabi because he would ask me for a huge bakshish. Um, so this is thanks to Muhammad Mbabi, art history on ancient Egypt made a significant progress. Um, inside this Roka tomb, we came across um, several quite interesting burials. This is one of them. We had uh, about two hours um, inside because the tafla, as you can see, started to, to fall on our heads and we had to run away very quickly up the shaft. But we still managed to save some funeral equipment consisting of miniatures, um, bones inside and outside. and. This is quite important, this is quite tricky. You can find it in most of the Old Kingdom robbed burial chambers. Why do you think they were pursuing this strategy? They just um, cut off a corner in the sarcophagus. The, the, the intention was just to grab the mummy, pull it out, and search it for treasures, because they were interested only in treasures, in antiquity. 
not nowadays, but in antiquity they just needed the mummy out, search it for small valuables and run away with them in pockets. So that's why they always cut away just a small part of the corner, pull out the mummy and that was it. This is how looks a in situ, in situ interment. Sarcophagus from another shaft in the same complex, um, featuring even fingerprints when uh, the uh, worker was uh, sealing the fissure between, um, between the lower and upper part of the sarcophagus, between the chest and the lid. Uh, mummification uh, uh, vessels, canopic vessels, and here we have to touch textbooks again. Um, because according to textbooks, um, we should see that the fifth dynasty people were mummified, which is wrong. I tell you, I will show you another example. Because when this was in situ burial, this intact wall, like in the case of Ha. Um, next, it's, it's here, um, upstairs. Um, in the canopy uh, jars were never used. And in many cases, we can prove it now, they were never used. They were only part of the symbolical game. They were produced in a very rough way. Indicate that on a symbolical level, the guy was mummified. But what they did, in fact, was that, that they soaked the body in a natron. That was it. And you didn't need to mummify the body anymore. So this is only... Um, a very symbolical game. Inside we came across a this gentleman aged uh, between 40 and 50 years in different places uh, with heaps of uh, faience beads that could be very nicely documented with uh, three-dimensional uh, photographs. and use it as a very efficient archaeological tool. And this is a progress of the work on the, on the jewelry he had inside. So if you compare it with this sort of uh, matter of things, and this is quite, a, it's quite a reasonable progress. And now we are even uh, further. Um, I said Osiris, New Sarah, groundbreaking period. Um, what was uh, coming to our minds since several years were burials uh, literally, literally flooded with mud as a new kind of burial setup, as a new symbolical approach to burials in the Old Kingdom. In many cases we were not able to confirm this new practice that seems to occur precisely from New Sarah on, until 2014. November 12, 2014, we uh, hit, I unwrapped very small burial. You have to follow me from here. You can see it's in situ. These are remains of the original wall that was blocking the entrance. Funerary offerings consisting of vessels an imported Syrian two-handled amphora. When we removed the offerings, including animal bones, etc., we came across a mud layer, indicating that this layer was genuine. It was so when they were burying the kid, the kid is about 12 years old, they put into uh, the pit first the kit. In the second step, they filled the pit to a certain level with clean windblown sand and sealed it in order to make sure that the, that the body gets resurrected, like Osiris in the papyrus circuit of the delta with a mud layer. So this is for the first time we can prove that this was an intentional, religiously conditioned, symbolical behavior developed according to new 
religious uh, premises. Um, the final tomb I have to offer is this one, belonging to Neferinpu. A small mastaba here can see entrance into the solar mastaba. Uh, to the, here is the tomb of Shepseskafanch. So they were basically neighbors, divided only by a small corridor. Um, here we have entrance into the superstructure, now covered. And here was running this beautifully preserved uh, corridor chapel, featuring four offering niches with a Abusir Sakara cemeteries, there were maybe four or five really rich families that ruled the whole country. And the same, very similar stuff is for the Sixth Dynasty plus the provinces. But this is really just a very small, very small example of what you can do nowadays with modern Egyptological uh, procedures. And to finish the story of the complex, um, above, above the uh, a bust above shared Nepti over there, uh, we came across beautifully, well, if I were not in Turin, I would say beautifully preserved, but uh, in Turin, uh, it's very difficult, but uh, at least this one is just fine. Um, um, boats um, dating to the fifth dynasty. Um, this is uh, what I uh, had on my mind when I uh, received this beautiful invitation to Turin. Uh, and as a bonus, I want to show you something that hit the headlines over the last few uh, weeks. It is the so-called Abusir boat. Of course, it's not the boat of Khufu, but still it's a boat that dates uh, to the Third Dynasty. It's related to a mastaba dating to the time of Huni, as you can see on this um, inscription. The boat is over here. It's about 18.5 meters long structure. And you can see the location of the boat, the remains, because so far we uncovered only um, maybe one third of it. And we hope to continue uh, with this boat um, this spring. It preserves beautiful technical details. Um, shortly after this, the discovery, we uh, I've contacted uh, um, Institute for Nautical Archaeology at the University of Texas and they, when they saw these pictures they got absolutely excited because they said from the, at least from the technological point of view this is a very new um, example of boat building. Moreover, moreover um, the most fascinating uh, story is that uh, the boat dates to the third dynasty and is related to a non-royal tomb from the time of Joser Huni. And we don't know, we, unfortunately, we don't have the name of the guy who was buried in this beautiful mastaba, nor do we have the entrance to the burial chamber. We are not, I am not able, after 25 years in the field, to locate the burial chamber. We did everything. I can, take, I can talk about it over a glass of wine, but believe me, we did everything. We don't have the burial chamber. Um, so this is um, just a, basically it's the first um, public introduction of this boat. So that's my uh, small thank you to, uh, uh, to the uh, brave people of Turin Museum because they really did this in one year. That's, I can't imagine this. I really can't imagine this. Um, so as you can see, Abu Sir, and this was just a very small slice of other things that we do in Abu Sir. Um, is um, still a upcoming site, I would say, because there are, and I know it, uh, there are many surprises. Um, what I, um, what's the primary objective of this talk is that um, despite all books, despite all articles, all scholarship, we know very little about the third millennium. Um, it's, um, when you really do it properly with all scientific uh, methods you can use or you can afford to use. Um, if you do it with respect both to uh, general theories and uh, individual people, because history is connected with individual people, um, you can um, really see um, Egypt from a completely different perspective. Uh, and then when you go back to the collections such as uh, 
one here, you can uh, uh, see one of the earliest civilizations that existed on this planet from a completely different perspective, uh, with completely uh, different eyes. And to say, um, last but not the least, um, and I indicated it already in my talk, uh, archaeology is very political because what we experience today um, is there. It's uh, the fight of power groups, it's the rise and the failure of the elites, it's different political um, lines of um, running state things, um, economical failures, um, religious changes, monumental architecture, mystery. So they were not different, and we are not different. Even climatic change, there is nothing new in this world. Everything is attested. So in a way, in a way, I like to say that archaeology, if you do it really well, can be, um, can be one of several strategic um, scientific uh, investigations for this century. Because if we know our past, if we understand the processes, and archaeology describes the anatomy of these processes, both on individual and on general level, we can be wiser and more humble at the same time. So this is how I understand archaeology today. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you, thank you, for Professor Barta. <clears throat> I really appreciated your conclusion, especially your conclusion, because um, the way you are interpreting archaeology is actually the work we are doing in a museum like the Egyptian Museum, uh, because we are trying to connect the present with the past, and uh, we try to highlight the importance of the past in order to interpret the present to our uh, visitors, so it's exactly what we feel, and I can speak for on behalf of my colleagues too. And thank you for sharing with us your uh, last discoveries. And uh, I personally followed uh, the progress of your work enthusiastically. So I, I just have one question: so what's next? What, what's next? So what's in the in your schedule? The the next program of work in the Abu Zeyl Necropolis, and. Um, and I will give you the opportunity, obviously, to, uh, if you have some question, uh, if you have any question, to, uh, to give it to our professor. So. Um, first to your question, maybe, what we, uh, what we plan to do next in Abu Sir is, um, um, basically, I would say to keep going, which, is, uh, which can be very tricky itself. Um, in the next months to come, uh, we plan first to finish the boat because it's really a pressing issue uh, to save as much as possible and to document as much as possible. Of course, we also use, use 3D technologies. And then um, to finish um, um, the fourth Mastaba, south of Hentkaus, the third. And then um, bring in um, bunch of people that have to focus on, on the finds we already have in the storage and finish a, a C14 corpus uh, that we uh, started to build some years ago that uh, should uh, provide us with a better um, framework for dating individual Old Kingdom, Old Kingdom monuments, particularly from the 5th and 6th dynasties. And then, uh, I couldn't talk about it in detail, but uh, Maybe at some point to open a new uh, a new serapium that we have there, and we know it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is there, unfortunately. So stay tuned. Yeah, stay, <laughs> stay tuned. Too. Exactly. Maybe there are some uh, comments or questions, remarks. Okay, thank you very much again and uh
see you in the future.